Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation about a critically important topic. And I want to begin by thanking all of our partners that you met this morning for making this experience possible, and in particular, Ripley's Aquarium for being such gracious hosts. Thank you, Ripley's Aquarium, for having us today. And I also want to acknowledge a new partner to the table, the Georgetown AME District, which actively recruited folks to take interest in this program and will be taking messages back to their community. So, so thanks for engaging us in this regional conversation. Um, what I'd like to do today is, first of all, in just a few moments, share with you this very distinguished panel. These are folks that have different perspectives and different expertise on what is a really complex subject. And so hopefully they will set the stage for us to engage in a dialogue that will include questions and answers at the end so that we can hear from you what's on your mind because we're really on a listening tour. We want to understand what's at stake from your perspective and what the concerns are that you have in your own lives and in your community. Uh, but before we get there, I, I want to just say a few words about why the aquarium or these aquariums together because I think most people think about aquariums as places of attraction and, and certainly that's true. This, what a wonderful facility this is to enjoy. Um, but at a deeper level, we have a mission that speaks also to conservation. And our role is to make sure that people understand what's valuable in the natural world and what we have to do to preserve and care for it. So we both operate, both Ripley's and, and the South Carolina Aquarium operate education programs. We teach kids on the floor. We teach kids in classrooms, classrooms around the state. Uh, all told, the South Carolina Aquarium has educated more than a million school children since we opened in, in 2000. We're also engaged directly in conservation programs. And as you heard this morning, one of those programs is making sure that sea turtles uh, remain with us. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years and they're at risk, they're endangered species now. And I see several sea turtle volunteers and thank you so much guys. Power of sea turtles. It takes a community coming together to make sure that they'll be around for generations to come. So that's a very important part of it, our work. And um, so that brings me to this topic today, because this is certainly a topic that requires conservation and education. I think that's areas where Ripley's Aquarium and South Carolina Aquarium together excel. Uh, I want to start by talking about something that uh, we experience directly at the South Carolina Aquarium. We're perched on, this, on the mouth of Charleston Harbor. And uh, if you've been to Charleston or if you live near Charleston or visited, you may know that we've got this thing happening now that we affectionately refer to as nuisance flooding. And it's when the waters get to about seven feet or so. It's, it's called king tides. And suddenly these low-lying areas of the city and the region begin to flood and become impassable to motor vehicles, but actually pretty dangerous. Last year, that happened 37 times. Go back 30 years, it was happening about five times a year. So, so what's going on? Well, there's more water in the harbor. Uh, we know there's a foot more water in the harbor just by measurement over the last century. Fast forward another 30 years, and we anticipate that there will be 180 keen tide events in Charleston. That's every other day. It will be the new norm. So when does the nuisance become a sounding alarm, if you will? I want to share with you some images, and I'm not going to get heavily into the science because we've got scientific experts all lined up here, but I'm going to show you a few images. Now, this is the coastline around Myrtle Beach. It goes roughly from uh, Pauly's Island in, in the bottom of the screen to the, to the upper right, uh, Bird's Island at the border. And this is where things stand today. And this is all part of NOAA's digital coast. And you can go online and find this resource. But you're able to slide a scale that anticipates what would happen if there was another foot of water, just like we've enjoyed over the last century, or two feet of water, so on and so forth. And, and so here's one foot of water, and suddenly you see um, a lot more blue around areas that, where the river basins reside and where we have these wonderful wildlife refuges. And, and you may say, well, so what? That's, that's nature interacting with nature. But you start to look down here along this ribbon of shoreline, and I'm going to go to two feet and three feet. And I realize this is hard to see, but you can do this at home online. Four feet, five feet, six feet. And suddenly, th these barrier islands, there's a lot of blue where there was beach, right? So there's tremendous resource and uh, lives at risk as sea levels increase along the shoreline, even here at a higher elevation in Myrtle Beach. Again, you'll hear from the experts on this topic in just a few minutes. So what does this mean, sea level rise? First of all, it's, it's a great threat to our salt marshes. These are wonderful nurseries for so many species that inhabit our shores. Uh, it's a threat to beachfronts, and as beaches erode and accrete, 
uh, species like sea turtles are, are finding it more and more difficult to find a place to lay their eggs. This is an image of Isle of Palms and what we call a false crawl. So this is a sea turtle mother that's come ashore. You don't see her anymore, but you see her tracks. She's met up with resistance and had to return to sea without laying her eggs. And you also see threat of increased runoff from, from major storms and flooding that bring more pollutants into the water. This is actually a dolphin off the coast of Florida that we are assuming was the victim of some sort of environmental poisoning, uh, likely from runoff around the Indian uh, Lagoon. So this is uh, a concern that, that faces us as, as wildlife advocates. Now, we're never going to get people to care broadly about wildlife unless we can get them to understand what's also at stake for human beings. And so just to set the table for today's conversation, uh, here's the shoreline of South Carolina. As you may have picked up in the uh, film that we just saw, there's about $70 billion of property at stake in, in single home residences along the coastline. That's a lot of real estate. Uh, if you look at the impact of uh, business and economics like tourism, 20 million people come to this shoreline from Myrtle Beach to Savannah every year. These are people that don't know a lot about what's at risk. They don't know about flooding. They don't know about hurricane evacuation. It just complicates our lives as wonderful as all that tourism is to the economy. If you look at industry, um, Charleston and Savannah alone comprise one-eighth of the total cargo shipping uh, in North America. So it's a tremendously vital resource that's at stake. The military has huge presence up and down our shores. This is Paris Island. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, before, before we spoke to some folks in Beaufort, there was a major announcement, and it was published in USA Today, that Paris Island is considered the second most vulnerable military installation in the, in the United States, and it's because of climate change. So the Pentagon is taking this issue very seriously. We've been fortunate to get a lot of new industry into South Carolina over the last few years. Uh, organizations like Boeing, Volvo still to come. Will these industries come in the future if we don't begin to take stock of these issues and start to create prescriptive solutions uh, to the environment? And then you get into the whole realm of history and culture. And of course, this is Fort Sumter. Uh, I know personally the superintendent of Fort Sumter is greatly concerned about what rising sea level means to the existence of this, this structure. It's beginning to erode, and will it be around for future generations to acknowledge and appreciate and respect? Likewise, the arts are greatly at stake. This is a very fertile uh, environment of arts from the uh, Savannah School College of Art and Design through the Spoleto Festival to the wonderful artisans that reside in, in Myrtle Beach and, and environments. And then finally, I, I want to acknowledge um, uh, African-American identity itself, which is such a critical part of the fabric and history of this community. Um, you know, here we see uh, Mary Jackson, this wonderful basket weaver, and, and keeping alive the Gullah Geechee tradition. One of the traditions that African-American slaves brought to these shores was this wonderful cultivation of rice and a very sophisticated technique that was the, the backbone, literally, of the economy uh, a couple of hundred years ago. And they also brought with them this tremendous reverence and respect for that delicate balance between land and sea. And so it's with that respect and with that ingenuity that the South Carolina Aquarium has recently launched the Resilience Initiative for Coastal Education, doing what we do best to engage people in education on this, this very complicated topic. One of the things we've been doing is joining with our partners and going up and down the coast. Uh, in these town halls, we started at the Penn Center uh, a couple of months ago. We're going to have another session after this one in Savannah this fall. Uh, and it's creating already inroads to go back into these communities and have deeper conversations and to identify partners. This is an image of the, the town hall in Penn Center. We're also developing citizen science tools and apps that will allow everybody to join in documenting the science and being scientists. So this fall, in October, we'll be launching a rising sea level app. And what you can do online right now with NOAA, you'll soon be able to do on your phone and put in your own address and see what's going to happen over time, potentially, if we do get, ultimately, six feet of sea level rise. And then in the realm of hard science, we're joining with uh, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Uh, you heard in the film, and this is, again, making the global local, the impacts of Hurricane Sandy and the catastrophic loss. We want to be on the front end of that. We want to understand what's at stake if that kind of storm, if we have a new Hurricane Hugo with all that new water sitting out there, what it would mean to our coastline. So there's this very sophisticated modeling that has been done post-mortem to Hurricane Sandy in New York. We're going to bring the same technology to our shoreline and understand uh, what we need to do to protect ourselves. 
I mean, all of this is driving toward the desire to have a regional groundswell of awareness and demand for change and for preparation. We're all in this together. Uh, the folks that we've talked to in Beaufort are just like you today. They're, they're curious about the topic. They want to know what they can do from a personal level to help. They want to know what's in it for them as well. We want to bind everybody together uh, to make sure that we're planning effectively for the future. As Al George heard at a conference recently, uh, we may be the first generation to deal with this issue, but we may be the last generation to do something about it. So with that in mind, I'm so pleased to introduce our panelists. We're going to start with three folks that have PowerPoints and are going to come up to the podium, and then we'll introduce the other three panelists. So our first speaker today is Mel Bell. And Mel is the director of the Office of Fisheries Management at the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. And he oversees the state's efforts to manage our varied commercial and recreational fisheries and resources. He's been with DNR since 1983 and previously managed the South Carolina Marine Artificial Reef Program, and he was formerly the scientific diving officer for DNR. He served both active duty and as a reservist for the US Navy, as a BS in marine biology from the University of West Florida, and a master's in biological oceanography from Old Dominion. A true expert and uh, looking forward to hearing from you, Mel. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and I appreciate since we're at the aquarium, fish get to go first, I guess. So that's, <laughs> that's a great thing. What I'm hoping to do this morning is just give you a very brief uh, overview from a fisheries manager's perspective of what climate change uh, can mean in terms of impacts on the resources themselves, impacts on our fisheries, impacts on our communities. Um, so I will, uh, I just have a few things here. Do I need to point? Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, first of all, uh, just some terminology. When we talk about fisheries management, fishery management, it really involves more than just focusing on the fish. A fishery consists of the fish or species that we manage. Uh, it consists of the habitats that, that, uh, that they live in. It also consists of the people that engage in that fishery. So as fishery managers, we have to be, it's a very multidisciplinary uh, science we have to be able to kind of understand these interconnections between the, the resource, the habitats, and the people, and each one affects the other. So when we talk about climate change, what we're talking about is potential impacts specifically uh, on the habitats. Uh, Kevin did a nice job of teeing up some things I'll talk about, uh, as well as the fish themselves. If water temperatures change or salinities change or uh, sea levels move around, this can affect the fish as well as habitats. Uh, more terminology. So we talk about in marine fisheries, there's a system of governance we have, and then there's management itself. And by governance, that's the framework that we have in place to actually make things happen. That can be federal, regional, state, regulatory bodies. I work for the Department of Natural Resources. We're a state uh, agency. But we work very closely with National Marine Fisheries Service, federal. Uh, regional would be the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So each each group has a particular area that they deal with. Um, and you'll see that climate change can kind of confound that governance structure because in governance structure with jurisdictions and authorities, we draw lines. And if, if, the hab if fish don't respect those lines, then it throws us off. And then we, we have to figure out how to deal with that. And we are actually dealing with things where fish are starting to cross lines that, 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 weren't, uh, that we would rather they didn't, but that's what they're doing. Uh, the management itself is just the process of making the decisions that we make to take care of the resource. Uh, and a way to uh, think of that, it's primarily what we get involved in when setting, uh, setting limits or regulations uh, to what you can and can't take or when you can and can't take it. So in fisheries management, and this is the, I threw a formula in here, but you, you won't be required to remember that. It's very, very simplistically speaking, when you talk about managing a fishery, there's a, a group of animals that you're trying to, to manage, you deal with these different factors. Uh, fishing mortality means what we take out of the resource. It's how many fish we catch, how many shrimp we catch, how many crabs we catch, oysters we take. Uh, that's something we can control in conventional management. What we can't really deal with sometimes are 
the recruitment or growth aspect, that's what the, the fish or the animal does itself biologically. Uh, recruits are just additional fish that come into a population. The growth is the growth over time. Those can be affected by climate and by habitat. <clears throat> Natural mortality is just all the reasons fish can think of to die or leave the system that are controlled by all these factors other than, th than what we manage. So what fishery managers typically deal with is this fishing mortality. But what climate change is really pushing on are some of these other areas, the recruitment, the growth, and the natural mortality. Uh, from the DNR, Marine Resources Division standpoint, our job is basically resource stewardship. And we view our role very seriously in taking care of these public trust resources for the citizens of this state and, and the betterment of, of folks' lives. Folks, uh, you'll, you'll see in a second here, I'm going to just give you a quick overview of what we mean when we talk about commercial or recreational fisheries. So there's a lot at stake here. Uh, South Carolina is blessed to have a diverse and abundant uh, fisheries resource. Uh, we have uh, everything from that you're familiar with if you're around here, shrimp, crabs, all kinds of fish. Um, we, and this includes things offshore. Uh, we have fisheries that engage way offshore, 20, 30, 40, 50 miles offshore. We have fisheries that are focused on our inshore waters. But we have very diverse fisheries. Our commercial fisheries you can basically kind of lump into, into key areas. Uh, our shrimp fishery is, is economically speaking kind of our big, our big uh, fishery commercially in South Carolina. Uh, followed by fin fish, which just means any fish from uh, species offshore to inshore as well. We have a, a very robust shad fishery in South Carolina, which is an inshore uh, or, uh, species. Uh, blue crabs, oysters, and clams. So that's kind of the general categorization. In terms of economic value, uh, just don't worry about the pie diagram. The total figure is our, our commercial fisheries generate usually $24, $25 million a year just in X vessel value. That, that means just that's the price at the dock. That's not the price that you pay or, the, or the, when you, uh, I'm not an economist, but when you, if you're an economist, you add economic multipliers and that value goes way up. But just, just alone, raw seafood product, about 24, 25 million a year. Um, and now if you actually start playing around with some of the economics, these data are from a NOAA report, which comes out about every five years, so they're a little old. Uh, but in South Carolina, our commercial fisheries are basically valued at about $88 million. That's with sales impacts. That's if you follow the seafood product through the economy and the jobs it generates. Uh, actual jobs in the industry itself, about 1,500 jobs with commercial fisheries related. So we're not as big as some states, uh, but we're bigger than Georgia. <laughs> I say that. I'm from Georgia. <laughs> uh, our recreational fisheries. Recreational fisheries are not just for fun, but people enjoy them. That's the term recreational. Very diverse. Again, it's the same species that we rely on for commercial fisheries in a lot of cases. Uh, and it's anything from uh, uh, billfishes, marlin, sailfish offshore to dealing with uh, oysters and clams and things inshore. So very diverse, uh, very popular, and you'll see actually economically significant for the state. Uh, in South Carolina alone, there are about 480,000 individuals, probably a lot of you, that have privileges to fish in salt waters recreationally. Uh, that doesn't mean all 480,000 are out there at the same time, but there are just that many people with the privilege to do that. Generates about uh, close, well, 1.8 million trips a year, individual fishing trips a year. Economic impact actually more significant in the commercial side of the house, but at about, the estimated here was about 282 million a year to the state's economy. Uh, jobs, 3,000 or so jobs, so more jobs. So you'll see that our recreational fisheries, uh, in terms of being an economic stimulus, uh, is a, there's a lot at stake just in terms of the value of those fisheries and the benefit for people that enjoy fishing. Okay, now, I mentioned the e impacts of climate change. I'm just talk in general sense of, of some examples for environmental impacts on fisheries. Changes in water temperature. And sometimes these changes can be what we say there are winners and losers. They could be good effects. They could be bad effects. There are short-term effects. There are long-term effects. So just some examples under temperature change. If you see uh, water temperatures changing uh, over time due to, due to uh, uh, climate change, uh, some of the positive things about warmer winters for us in South Carolina uh, and warmer water temperatures is actually a more abundant shrimp crop. 
This year, we are experiencing the highest level of white ship shrimp landings that I've ever seen since I've been here. Uh, it's pretty, it's, it was very impressive so far. We're hoping for a really good fall. But that's because our, our white shrimp are basically an annual crop that are part of the, that they key on winters. When we have warm winters, we have good white shrimp crops. When we have cold winters, not so good. So that can be a, a good thing if, 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 our, if our winters are warmer. Uh, but you know, long-term effects can be, species can move around. If water temperature's warm, we may see more of a, a species coming up from the south, some of our species that may move farther north. We haven't really detected that so much here, perhaps in our region. Some things like blue line tilefish and black sea bass have, have indicated some, perhaps some, some shifts. But the animals just move. It's not that they're not there. They're just presenting themselves somewhere else for somebody else's fishery. But that can happen. Mean sea level, as Kevin mentioned, that's the one that I'll spend a little more time on later. But that can have some serious impact short term on infrastructure. If you have these king tides that uh, make boat ramps uh, or docks unusual, that can be a short term impact. Uh, long term impact is loss of critical habitat. Uh, changes in salinity. If you have more rainfall, less rainfall, it changes salinity. Animals will key and, and plants will key on specific salinity regimes. So uh, if the salinity changes, then uh, blue crabs uh, may move farther up the rivers or they may come down the rivers. Um, so just things like that. So these are all factors. I had also here ocean acidification, is, which is not really directed to this, but it is an environmental impact potentially. It can affect fisheries. But the big ones would be water temperature, mean sea level rise, and fluctuations in salinity. Uh, remember in the rainfalls we had last October, Winya Bay basically became a freshwater lake for all practical purposes. I mean, the salinity down there was extremely low. Uh, okay, just talking a little bit about uh, water temperature. Uh, winners and losers. So as I mentioned, a winner uh, from warmer waters could be the shrimp fishery. We could see a more robust white shrimp fishery because of warmer winters and better crops. Uh, uh, and what you're looking at here, you can't see that, is basically that is the 65-year mean water temperature for uh, Charleston Harbor at a USGS reference station. The, there's a blue line that's above that. That's the previous five-year average. So what you'll see is that the previous five-year average is kind of above the 65-year mean. The red line is this year. This year is the hottest um, summer, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> It's, it's been hot, and as you can see, the water temperatures in Charleston Harbor reflect that at this reference station. So, um, and, and as you'll see, the red line where it came in, we had an extremely warm winter. This, it, we're starting over here with January. So you see, we were eight degrees above the, the mean when, when we approached January this year, which is one reason we probably had such a great shrimp crop. Uh, uh, and so if, if our winters become warmer and warmer, that could be a positive thing. The negative side of warmer waters could be the shellfish fishery. Um, our, our oyster harvest uh, throughout the year, we, we typically, we now do not allow summer harvest of oysters, and the reason for that is primarily directed by human health and biological considerations for the oysters themselves. But when you start having warmer and warmer water, uh, you can have, um, uh, higher uh, concentrations of uh, harmful bacteria, Vibrio being one of the genus Vibrio. There are two uh, species of Vibrio that can have impacts on human health. So consumption of raw seafood or raw shellfish uh, can result in problems. So if we have warmer springs and warmer, uh, say, falls or into September, it can kind of extend the period of time that you might not want to be harvesting oysters, particularly for, for raw consumption. So, so that could cause your, your oyster industry to, to uh, need to adjust. And these are all, that's a human health concern, but it's directed by water temperature. Uh, sea level rise, and this is the one that, that I find the most terrifying, I guess, <laughs> uh, because uh, I can't really see um, winners in this one. It's kind of losers and losers. So what can happen is, as Kevin actually did a great job of, of showing you, uh, you can eventually, with, with rise in water levels, uh, lose your barrier island protection. If your barrier islands uh, basically become, uh, with, a, with a higher and higher ocean level, they can, they can uh, erode quicker. Uh, if the barrier islands go, or at some point you have a decrease in essential salt marsh habitat, keep in mind our salt marshes are key 
habitats, nursery grounds for, for many, many species, even offshore species. Uh, if those habitats are jeopardized because the, the salt marsh, which, which is an intertidal type grass, if it can't be intertidal anymore, it's not going to thrive. So you can have loss of salt marsh, you can have loss of intertidal oyster reef habitat. Something you may not know is our oyster uh, population in South Carolina is predominantly intertidal. Uh, that's true for us and Georgia. We have pretty good tide ranges here. But our oysters live in an intertidal region, so they're used to exposure at low tide and submergence at high tide, and that cycle. Um, if if uh, you basically put them in a position where they would be submerged all the time, they'll, they will start dying off for a number of reasons. Our, so you can have loss of our oyster habitats, and oyster habitats are not just about oysters. They, they serve a, a number of purposes in terms of ecosystem services, water filtration. They are also, the oysters themselves are habitat for a number of other uh, fish species and crustacean species. Um, so basically, if you start losing your salt marsh, you start losing uh, areas of your oyster habitat, you're losing these nursery grounds, that's not good for just species in general. And then the salt marshes themselves are tremendous uh, nutrient uh, re resources. So that's a lot of organic matter that goes into our water, which is a, a, the foundation, you know, the, basically the organic uh, uh, nutrients that, that feed the system. So if you lose that habitat, you lose that source of nutrients to some degree. Um, and then basically there's decreased productivity in our system, uh, and then decreased uh, or potential uh, impacts on fisheries. So you're basically, what's at stake here when when Kevin was showing you the, the rising sea level, the rising sea level, it, if, if the habitats, that those intertidal habitats can't move as they've been moving for thousands of years, then we have a problem. And that brings me to what I just call the, the sea level rise conundrum. <laughs> you can see the pictures very well, but, but basically if we start to lose uh, the, the marsh, uh, salt marsh habitat, the grasses, or we start to submerge the oysters constantly, we could potentially lose that. Now, the, the natural process is because, again, see, you know, it, several thousand years ago, and Paul can attest to this, I mean, the coastline was farther offshore. So the, the sea, the, uh, the shoreline has been coming in over time. But what early man did, or what we've done, the early residents of South Carolina did, was they retreated. They just retreated. And the, 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 the Basically, the natural progressions of these habitats just work their way inland. But now in these bottom two pictures, if you look at those, this is what we've done. Modern man has come along and said, well, I'm going to build a house, I'm going to build uh, condos, I'm going to build a shopping center, I'm going to... And so what's happened is we've sort of set up this hard, hard wall. And we as a society have to figure out how we're going to deal with that. You know, as sea level rises at whatever level it rises at, we'll come to a decision point at some point where do we retreat or do we hold our ground? And if we hold our ground, what happens then to these intertidal habitats that have a need to move? And if those habitats go, well, there goes the, the fishery. Uh, so for us in, in fisheries management, again, <laughs> Uh, what we have to kind of deal with is being able to predict impacts of some of these, uh, on some of these uh, habitats uh, of things like sea level rise or, or salinity changes or temperature, uh, modeling predicting impacts on natural mortality, figuring out how those factors, remember the R and the G, the growth and, and the recruitment, how does it affect those? Because those ultimately affect our ability to harvest. And then we've got to figure out how much we can harvest in an environment where this is taking place. Uh, you'll hear the term ecosystem-based management used. That's basically kind of thinking big picture holistically. How do we pull all this together to make better decisions for the fisheries? Uh, quantifying social uh, economic impacts. Again, these are real people with real jobs that depend on these fisheries. What are the impacts on them? And then we have to just figure out how to develop appropriate management responses. And then you've heard this mentioned before, living, doing all of this in an in a era of uncertainty. So that's my quick introduction to fisheries and uh, the connection to, to climate change. Thank Mel, thank you. That was excellent. Um, our next speaker has more information to convey, and he is Dr. Paul Gaze, who is director of the School of Coastal and Marine Systems Science, 
Director of the Center for Marine and Wetland Studies and Palmetto Professor of Marine Science and Geology for Coastal Carolina U University. He's an acknowledged global expert on coastal geologic behavior and processes, renewable marine energy, and ocean atmospheric modeling and climate change. So it's no doubt that he's frequently sought out by national print and broadcast media to explain these very complicated issues, which is one of the many reasons why we're so happy to have Paul with us today. Okay, well, thank you very much. I um, uh, appreciate being here and had the opportunity to chat with everyone. Um, I, I believe I was kind of brought in to talk a little bit about the, the nature of, of climate change from a scientific perspective and to bring the global to the local, how it's playing out here from uh, many years of working here. I've been uh, engaged in studies in this region and elsewhere in the world looking at the, the fundamental changes in sea level uh, that, that are happening and how that's tied to climate change in large scale, but then also um, very many applied projects, things that are resulting from these kinds of forces such as beach erosion or the potential needs for new uh, types of energy, renewable energy and such. So it kind of spans from the basic to the applied and how it is playing out locally. Um, bring Mark Twain back into it. I wish we could bring him back. He seemed to be a very <laughs> smart man. Um, some of other phrases he's had is, is everyone talks about the weather and nobody does anything about it. I think that's kind of what the, the, the conference is about and the effort is um, related to climate. There's a lot of discussion about it. What are we doing about it? And, and will we do enough soon enough to make it uh, meaningful uh, and less expensive than it could otherwise be? And he also indicated that climate's what we expect and, and weather's what we get. So what it, what it put on the, the bottom here, if this is a, a kind of a continuum, and, and it kind of frames the, 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 the challenge we're having in the public discussion is, you know, weather is what's happening every day, and we probably have a pretty fair uh, appreciation for what August will be like this year, and we'll have a kind of a good idea what August will be like <laughs> next year, and it'll be cooler in the winter. This is a kind of, you know, short-scale time frames that we're familiar with um, weather in, in terms of the averages, and then that we have certain kinds of events sometimes a year, hurricanes more in one time of year than another. So we have that kind of familiarity on the short scale, and then um, I think increasingly we've, as a society, become more comfortable with the idea of things that are happening on interannual scales, like the El Nino cycles. We know, um, I think what you'll hear it frequently on the news when it projects whether it'll be a warmer winter or a wetter winter, or that it will be a more intense hurricane season or less intense hurricane season, has much to do with that process that's happening in the atmosphere on a, on a five to seven year kind of period. It's, it's the issues when things then merge into climate and we start talking about change in this continuum that there becomes a lot of discussion. So there's two ways that we tend to handle this in the scientific community. One is physics-based models. We really understand how this ocean, atmosphere, land system interacts and functions. We can write systems of equations that we can predict the future. And that's, that's, that's one of the ways that we really wish to pr 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 um, provide guidance to society. The other is really looking at the behavioralistic approach. How has the, the system behaved over the last 100 years or the last 50 years and, and such? And so one of the challenges becomes if we fundamentally change the system, then a lot of our expectations of how it will behave in the future are going to be off. And so um, the uncertainty goes up. So there is a challenge, but uh, uh, for example, one of the outcomes of the physics-based models is the expectation to see more intense and more frequent intense rain events. And so we could argue we're seeing them. And some people may say, well, that's just weather. It's not really happening. It's not something that, it's a change from the, the, the trend. And others are going to say, this is the beginning of what we've been predicting is going to happen. So, I mean, that's kind of the nature of the argument that's happening in society. So just, just as that as a, as, a, as a context for the discussion. Um, here in the coastal zone, the fundamental issue is, is that we got a lot of people um, moving into the coastal zone. This is a picture of Coney Island in, in 1940. If you're in the back, you can't see it, but that is all people on the beach. There's not a, <laughs> there's not a place for a blanket. And um, the, the, that the system that they're coming to visit, such as here in the Grand Strand, is, is the beaches, is, is moving or it wants to move. It wants to be moving in a landward direction as effective of, of sea level rise. So that's the fundamental issue. Um, and some of the uh, as results of those issues, or some of, the, uh, of those drivers that we see is certainly in the case of drainage and flooding. That, that, that water level is, is the point of contact. That's where the, 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 the rubber hits the road is, is sea level. Uh, that's the first line of attack uh, for this moving system, and it dictates how things drain and where they drain to. So on, on this chronic um, case, you know, you hear this a lot, 
there's flooding in the usual times at the time of high tide during this rain event we're expecting, say, the next day or two. Um, that's something we hear a lot, and we hear it a little bit more frequently, and we hear it a little bit broader areas. The usual places are becoming a little larger. As I mentioned very much about Charleston, and, and those are dramatic changes, but we're seeing it here in the Grand Strand as well. And then there's these, these episodic events, like the Joaquin Complex that came through that was very devastating um, economically and, and impacted many, many, many lives. Uh, so so these, are, these are things that are happening and we have to uh, consider. Here along the coast, coastal erosion is a big issue. Um, this uh, economy is largely driven around that beach. In the 1980s, when they set up the Beachfront Management Act, the vision and the wisdom of that act was uh, people determined that uh, the, the principle was that that beach is there, that's the economic engine that allows all this uh, industry and, and uh, uh, tourism-based economy to be um, uh, based upon. So, so they tried to come up with management uh, strategies to protect that beach to protect the economy. And that was, I think, the, the, the vision that was there in the 80s at the time. Um, as it's uh, playing out with rising sea level and winds and waves and currents, the nature of our coasts are to erode and to want to migrate. We want to keep them where they are. So the way we're doing that is largely through renourishment. We're, we're dumping sand on the beach periodically to replace that which is moving away. And, and to the tune, I think the first project in the Grand Strand was you know, 50, 60 million dollars or something like that. There's been for 24 miles of coast. And they're about to do this again, I think, this winter. I think Surfside Garden City is going to be nourished. It happens periodically. The reality is it's a midterm solution to a long term problem. We can keep doing this, and we've been doing it pretty effectively, but we're not making the land behind the beach any higher as the sea comes up. So we'll show some other examples how that plays out. There's pressure um, uh, then to look towards more engineering structures, which was what we tried to get away from in South Carolina in the 1980s, was seawalls and groins and these engineering structures that were there to try to protect or keep the beach from moving. The state tried to move away from it in the 80s, but as the pressure comes on, the, there'll be pressure to try to maybe move back to these kinds of structures if we're not going to look <coughs> at ways to maybe retreat from the beach in some places. Um, there's going to be increasing expense. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be harder to do this in the future, it's something we should recognize and start planning for budgetarily. And the pressure is going to get stronger. It's already happening. Um, and there's going to be pressure on our roads and our infrastructure, um, from, as you saw in the video. Um, interestingly, the state of New York has recently had an experience with Hurricane Sandy and a uh, very devastating effect that's happened up there. And as a state, they're now planning for their changes in infrastructure, their uh, changes in, in, in terms of many policies in terms of how to go forward into the future with the expectation, to plan for an expectation of a two meter rise in sea level. So if we're gonna redo our infrastructure for drainage, let's pipe it up to make sure that we're planning to drain for being six feet higher than it is at present, let's just not replace the, the existing. So that's an interesting strategy that's taken at a state level. Not all states are, are making these kinds of decisions. Um, uh, energy is tied into these, these uh, our en energy issues are, are really tied into it. As you heard in the video, there's a lot of water consumption tied into the, uh, con the generation of energy, but there's also a great deal of carbon being generated and it's adding and contributing to the complexities of our atmosphere and our climate issues. So um, the, the, they're not separate issues. There's a, there's a lot of initiatives now looking at the potential of renewable energy off the coast here in the Grand Strand. It's one of the larger uh, potentials along the East Coast is North Carolina, South Carolina, because we have a good wind field. We have low uh, water depths out to a, a considerable distance from the coast. And uh, there's some exploration in terms of the potential of generating electrical power uh, through wind energy rather through carbon or, or gas turbine. Uh, so those are tied in. Again, recently New York as a state, as they heard in the, in the video about California, they've gone to a 50% of their uh, portfolio of energy um, production to be from renewable, um, which is a significant commitment. So in the short term, it may be a, a somewhat more expensive approach, but in the long term, it, it may be a savings in a number of ways. So we, we really need to be thinking whether climate, short term, long term, uh, in our economic thinking and planning as well. Uh, one of the issues that's going to be continuing to come up is going to be potable water. That's really going to be a big deal, uh, both as the sea level's rising and areas are getting more saline. Um, 
places that might be pulling groundwater for their water sources, might be pulling salt water into uh, a further inland than it might have been in before. Uh, that's going to be a big issue. You're seeing issues between states who's taking water for either hydroelectric uh, production, say in the Savannah River Basin or other uh, uses for that water. There's a lot of, a lot of pressures that are coming with that water. It's not just what's um, draining down the coast. Uh, it's what we're going to use for many, many sources. So all of these are economic issues, and they all have kind of threats and potentials. Um, to, to kind of speak more directly to shoreline change and things that maybe a more uh, direct expertise in, these are really the drivers for things that are happening along the beach. It's how much sediment do we have available, what are the waves and currents like that are moving things around, and, and sea level defines the point of conflict. So, so all these things are variable, and they change on different periods. Um, we had a project a couple of years back that was uh, a NOAA-funded project um, that was coordinated by uh, OCRM, South Carolina OCRM, and it was a planning assistance to states, trying to project the vulnerability of the state of South Carolina to climate change 50 years out. My responsibility was trying to project the oceanfront vulnerability. Colleagues at USC had responsibilities for looking at marshes and, and uh, riverine settings. Um, another colleague at USC was looking at social vulnerabilities, and a colleague at Clemson was looking at economic vulnerabilities. So, so my role was on, on the ocean front. And I knew it was going to be a bit of a challenge because they had done this for a, a USGS and NOAA panel for the Mid-Atlantic US, and, and it, was, it was quite a challenge to do this. Making these projections is not, not that straightforward from the science uh, perspective. Um, so one, knowing that the, the problem that I was going to run into, we said, let's first start and use the models that we would use to project the future. You saw the, the coastal or the NOAA's uh, uh, ocean uh, uh, website that was looking at these uh, bathtub rings, the a foot rise of sea level, two feet rise of sea level. The ocean front is more dynamic. It moves around, it, and bathtub rings aren't really the, the appropriate way to go. So I had used some of the models that we would project the future with and say, let's see how well they did for this area for the past. So this would have been, uh, for the Myrtle Beach area, the projection would have been a, a significant amount of retreat of the shoreline that should, would happen and should have happened in the last 50 years. And what actually happened that was measured was the shoreline went forward. It went seaward. We did not expect that. So what is this all about? This isn't what we expected. Well, one of the reasons that happens is society stepped into the game. Uh, we had uh, renourishment projects, which essentially over the 20-year period had consistently built the shoreline out. It actually became an issue as far as jurisdiction, where the state's jurisdictional baseline, when you applied the criteria, in some places it actually would have moved seaward, which might have allowed uh, construction to move seaward closer to the edge. It wasn't what was anticipated. So as we start to project and make models uh, and projections of what's going to happen in the future, we've got to allow for consideration of societal responses, because we're clearly not sitting here passively. We are part of the system. Um, the other challenge was I knew that the sea level records in the southeast were going to be problematic. Uh, there's some publications that came out that were uh, reanalyzing the tide gauge data. There's one right here at Spring Maid Pier here in Myrtle Beach, and, and this is basically the monthly average water levels um, measured from 1977 to you know, the maybe 2010 or so in Myrtle Beach. And, and walking into a room of coastal managers and suggesting we need to do tremendous changes in adaptation for threats of sea level rise when that's the record doesn't take a statistician to tell you that you've got a problem. Most people will sit there and eyeball that and go, why are you talking to us about sea level rise? It's not rising. And the problem is, is that we're looking at this continuum and time frame. So if we look at the, the longer time frame, we've added more recent data here and a little bit longer data. In the last uh, 60 years or so, uh, water's come up about a foot measured here in Myrtle Beach, right? But if you look at it, it's not done it linear linearly. You've got a period in the 80s where it jumped up and then it was kind of flat lying. It actually dipped for the mean water level, statistically speaking, dropped in Myrtle Beach for a couple of years and now it's piping up again. This has to do with some longer term periodicities and drivers in the climate. Um, which we started to pull out from using um, uh, maybe a more appropriate statistical approach. So we don't need to get into this so much, but there's a method called empirical modal decomposition, which is made for nonlinear, non-stationary, very complex systems. And that's what we looked, uh, used to start looking at these records. And what you pull out of them is different periods of variability. There's seasonal variability, monthly variability, interannual, decadal, 60-year patterns that are out there. 
and drivers. Some of them, like El Nino, there's other oscillations, North Atlantic oscillation, there's the meridional overturning, there's all these drivers that are pushing on our system and and that it's responding to, and they happen at different time periods. So if you don't have very long data sets, you don't see these longer drivers. And on top of that, we have the very long-term change and, and any changes that we're adding to the system. So it gets very, very complicated. We do have some places in the world where there's a long term, longer term record. Here's the Netherlands, and you can start to see some of these longer term patterns that evolve out of that uh, record. Um, but the bottom line is it's been rising. It's rising most everywhere unless the land's coming up very high uh, at a high rate, uh, and it's something we have to deal with. Um, those that lived in this area in 2009, in uh, the summertime, we had an event all along the East Coast in the United States. Water level was about two feet higher uh, on average than it normally is, and it was like that for several weeks. This is Garden City here in the Grand Strand uh, during that period. There was no storm. It was a nice day. The roads were underwater. This was like your king tides, but this was one that then was a little bit more extreme, and it had to do with shifts in the high-pressure system and how the waters were then being driven in terms of the currents, and sea level is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not level. It, it, it has slopes to it that are driven by uh, winds and other um, currents. And so when those currents and winds shift, the water levels shift. And so the ultimate effect was two foot rise, two foot higher on average, like that. So it may, if a change in our, in our weather patterns where the high pressure system set up and they stay like that, this can happen quickly. It doesn't have to take 50 or 60 years. But if there's a fundamental shift, we can see some significant change happening faster. And it's something to, to be concerned about. It's not just the ice caps melting, it's the change in, in these other patterns. We also see that playing out in terms of where the hurricane tracks go. Do they go typically into the Gulf of Mexico or do they come up the East Coast? There's a periodicity to that that happens. And, and, we, and we certainly probably familiar, maybe in the 90s, what Wilmington got hit every year for, for about five or six years. And everything shifted on into the Gulf, generally. So we're doing a lot of work with projecting uh, hurricane intensity expectations on a seasonal basis and then modeling the, the, the individual events up the coastal and, and having some good success with that. But those kinds of drivers are really quite a concern along the coast. Uh, and this kind of the wild card we mentioned early on, really kind of really kind of concerned if these past patterns and cyclic drivers were already challenged by having only short-term time series data. We don't have lots of places with 60 years of data. We don't have time tie gauges all over the place. Many of them are in Charleston Harbor or they're up in near Wilmington. They're not even on the open ocean. So you've got other effects that are driving those 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 sensors, rivers, uh, what happens in the estuary. So we're really kind of challenged by this short time period of the data. But if we have fundamentally change something, some of the patterns, there's more weighting on El, El Nino forcings, or there's less weighting on it, the, the game changes a bit in terms of the predict, predictabilities. Um, we have seen these um, reports coming out. You know, Louisiana just the other day, uh, last couple, this, this past month, worst disaster since Sandy. And we talked, heard about Texas earlier. Not long after Louisiana, it, it was Davenport, Iowa, right? Just yesterday or the day before, they got hit with eight inches and massive flooding events. So, so this was one of the projections coming out of the modeling system that we're gonna see more and more of these events. Are we ready for them? Probably not. Uh, we're not ready for the big hurricane here either. Um, we made big strides since Hugo, but we're not ready for four. We didn't have a four here, nor did Charleston. Charleston was on the backside of Hugo and only had 13-foot surge. That storm goes into, uh, say, uh, uh, Edisto. Charleston's got 24 foot of water rather than 13. That storm comes into Winyaw Bay rather than McCollumville. We have 24 foot of water rather than 13. So we haven't been challenged by that storm kind of scale in the past. And, and changes have been made in building codes, and we've got renourishment projects in place. But we're not ready for, for four or five uh, as, a, as a community. So some conclusions, sea level's rising, you know, we can debate how much we may be modifying it or not, but it's, it's measurable, it, it's, not a, it's not a model, it's not a projection, you can see it happening. Um, it's putting pressure on our beaches or drainage systems, uh, that's putting pressure on our water quality because materials that are coming off the land are affecting uh, water quality, which is a, a big concern for coastal communities. And there are science-based reasons to expect that this is going to continue, if not accelerate, uh, significantly in the immediate future. And, and some places are, are arguably seeing this. In the mid-Atlantic, it's really coming up much faster. Um, and it's gone from 
you know, four millimeters a year to a centimeter per year, which doesn't seem like much, but that's a lot. So 10 years, it's that much. Um, and think about what that means in, in, in a place like South Carolina, it is substantial. Storms happen, Th these events are gonna continue to challenge us, and there's uh, projections that we might see shifting in the tracks of where some of the storm patterns might be going. We're seeing some northerly shift, say, in, in, in the northeaster easter tracks is one of the outputs of the models, but these kinds of shifts in from our expectations from the past are something we should be con 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 uh, considering. Um, sea level and storms are gonna challenge us differently. Renourishment isn't elevating the land surface, so we can keep putting sand out there and, and, and it may be worth it economically in some areas, but it's probably not gonna be economic in, in all areas, and we're, and we're gonna be challenged by that. Um, and, and again, we're not ready for a Katrina. I mean, somewhere out there is a bad day. And, and do you plan for that or do you plan for the chronic? These, these are the discussions we need to have. Um, I'm not sure we're generally planning for either in, in, in the real picture right now. Um, we can, as a society, um, challenge our engineering community to come up with solutions. These are clever people. And when we get to the moon, we, we surely we can, can resolve this problem. Um, and, and we're doing it in the short term by, by beach nourishment. I don't know if this will work. Yeah, that's an overflight of the renourishment at Folly Beach. So here's where it hadn't been renourished. And, and you'll see where the, the beach is being renourished. And people live here in, in the Grand Strand have seen this a couple of times now. It's going to be happening again. And so there's a big difference in comfort level, let's say, if you've got this wide of a beach in front of you. We'll come up a little bit <coughs> further along. You'll see where it hasn't yet been renourished and, and, and very dramatically see what the issue will be. Here's the pipe coming in from offshore. Out here off the Grand Strand, we are starved for sediment. You can go off a surfside for five miles and you'll not find any sand at all. Um, the areas that were sited for sand renourishment off of Myrtle Beach were projected for a 50 year life cycle. Um, one is already well past halfway and we're not halfway into the life of the, of the 50 year commitment. Um, others, say off of Surfside Garden City, are getting into federal water. You're talking about having to pay royalties for sand and put it on the beach. This is going to get more expensive. So we're really challenged for, for, uh, for sand. And you can see there in, in, in Folly where, where there, that hasn't happened yet. There's groins. These houses are, are at risk. They won't be there if we don't do something. So, so these are the realities. We have this in the Grand Strand. We'll show you a picture in a short bit. So one thing I'd like to try to frame the question for us as a community is, and, and this came up in a, um, had a testify to the North Carolina Coastal Commission on a um, policy on terminal groins, and they had a series of experts that came up, and, and, and I had basically was the bad cleanup as someone that didn't have a dog in the fight. And I said, you as the community um, and, and leaders in the community need to be thinking in this terms, um, the city of New Orleans was not settled below sea level. They didn't come there and, and build a city that was underwater. They, they settled along the coast, and things happened. The land subsided, the sea has come up. They made some responses to it. They made some adaptations to it. They made a number of decisions. They probably made a whole lot of non-decisions, and then somewhere down the line, we passed the threshold where our decisions are now made. We're gonna defend it. I mean, we're not gonna abandon New Orleans and all that, like, we're not gonna abandon Manhattan. But we cannot do this everywhere. All right, we, we, it's not, not, not likely. The problem is going to be uh, we're, we're unable to afford that scale of protection to maintain things in place everywhere. So there's an economic concern for that. And the environmental effects of that, as Mel was showing, the, the limited, uh, limiting of the salt marsh migration by, sh by development is, is a significant issue in all this. And if we do more armoring, we're gonna have more of an impact on that. So the environmental consequences may not be acceptable. Um, nature, unfortunately, is more persistent than we are, all right? That's one thing. Uh, she doesn't need bond issues or tax revenues to do anything, <laughs> all right? And generally balances her budgets, right? She, she understands conservation of mass and conservation momentum. We're, we're, we're not doing so good with, with that whole balance the budget thing, and, and it's, it's a significant a challenge for us. Um, it doesn't need votes or consensus to act, just acts. And it chooses the time and place of the battle. The hurricane comes in when, when nature says it does, and it doesn't really care if it's at the beginning of a renourishment project life cycle or the end of one. It doesn't really care if we're having an economic boom and there's money in the coffers that we can go and address it, or that we're having a struggling time 
and we're really we're really stretching for dollars, and we don't have the money to to deal with things. So so this is a uh, some some serious challenges. The Dutch have made walls like this around the country, 20 meter high walls. We we can do that if you want to pay a 30 year gross national product to do it. But there may be other options that we should seriously consider. But but these are things that have been done in other places, and again here we're we're doing renourishment primarily. Um, our communities and economy are dependent on, on sound so, uh, coastal management. I mean, this, 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 this uh, community here, um, I've lived here now almost 30 years, has changed tremendously, and, and, and so many more amenities and, and resources are here in the last 30 years because of the, the, the developments come with the, the tourism industry and the overall growth. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quality of life that's been very nice. Um, and enjoyed very much. But the reality is sand and sediment don't care where the jurisdictional boundaries are. It's not where we want it right off of Myrtle Beach. It's in other places. It's going to be expensive to get. Um, it, it's not uh, uh, so concerned by these economic conditions, as we mentioned. It's not going to be cheaper in the future. So uh, if we can think long term beyond perhaps uh, a, an election cycle, um, we can be saving money in the long term if we put a little bit more up on the front end. That's really challenging to do, as has been brought up, but that's ultimately where we have to be looking at things in the long term and, and making those investments. Um, some, tough, <laughs> some tough decisions are coming ahead. I mean, the next big storm that comes in, the next series of houses are going to fall in, we're, we're going to have to make some decisions. And, and uh, we're making them now, but are they interim? Are we deferring them? And then, and then the decisions will be made for us. Uh, that, that's really one of the things we should be worrying about. Uh, we really need to uh, depoliticize science and economic policy and, and infrastructural issues. It just, it just has to be done. Um, we, we, we are we. There's no us in them. And, and these things are going to uh, drive and, and pressure all of us. And they impact us in different ways, perhaps. But they are going to impact us. And we should be. Uh, clever enough as a society at this point to, to uh, think forward for the better for everyone, I, I would hope. Uh, and we need integrated management. Our, our, our environmental policy has got to be connected to our energy policy. It's reality. It's connected to our national defense and national security issues. And it's tied to um, uh, all these other kinds of arenas where we're making decisions. They're, they are very much interconnected. So I think we could find some 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 uh, economy there, and and just wanted to leave you with uh, uh, this is a, a site along our coast today. This is down in uh, south end of the Grand Strand. These houses are 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 at risk. I mean, the uh, waves are coming up underneath them. You see sandbags. There's uh, areas in South Carolina houses have fallen in fall, fallen in down at Hunting Island and other places. You can go all up and down the coast and see this, and all around the country and see it. So this is not a unique situation or unique problem. The issue is when is this not, becomes not just a little section of our coast here in the Grand Strand, but a little bit bigger, right? Same places at the usual places at the time of high tide, then a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, the next block, the next block, the next block, and the next thing you know, we're, we're at this threshold. So, so I think that was kind of the, the hope is to give that context of weather to climate the, the kinds of forces that we're dealing with, how it's playing out locally, and, and, and some perspectives, at least from having been in the game for a little while, trying to move the, the discussion along. So thank you very much. Paul, thank you. It's fascinating. And um, we're going to talk a little bit now about an issue you heard about in the film, which is the human health dimension of climate change. And our next presenter is Dr. Robert Ball. He's the infectious disease consultant and epidemiologist for South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. And during his distinguished career, he served on the faculty of the Medical University of South Carolina, the USC School of Public Health and School of Medicine, and as hospital chief of staff and president of the Columbia Medical Society. He spent several years in private practice and was credited as being the first physician to diagnose and report AIDS in South Carolina. And he was, in fact, the principal investigator of the inaugural South Carolina Ryan White AIDS program. He also consults on bioterrorism, port security, and emerging infectious diseases such as pandemic influenza and Zika virus. He's here today to inform us and not necessarily scare us. Dr. Ball. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Aquaria, to the other sponsors, and especially to MUSC 
Peku for inviting me on uh, not only climate change, but a new topic, emerging infectious diseases, with a focus on Zika, which has uh, come to our attention, of course, since the microcephaly cases in Brazil last year hit the global scene, and it indeed is a pandemic. Uh, to put things in perspective, um, I agree fully with all the speakers that we should depoliticize uh, the science of climate change, whether you call it climate change, extreme weather. We know that global warming is a subset of that, and we know that, uh, as President Obama said in the State of the Union address, 2014 was then the warmest year on record. It, we know now 2015 is, and 2016 is on course to become the next or the most warmest year, if you will, on record. If anyone doubts that uh, this is not a true progression and is simply cyclic change, as so many climate change deniers think that it is, then I invite them to Google pump handle, pump handle, like a handle of a pump. And this is a production by NOAA latest version 2014 that will give you a good five plus minute video of uh, the temperatures of the earth as measured both directly since the mid 1800s and by ice core samples from the Antarctic and the Arctic uh, going back 800,000 years, almost a million years, there's a direct correlation between carbon dioxide, the carbon we put into the atmosphere, and the Earth's temperatures. And although you will see millennial fluctuations, uh, there are 800,000 years, is a direct, there's a direct linear correlation. And I think we can all agree that that is a very legitimate source. So. What I'm challenged to do is to talk about emerging infectious diseases as related to climate change. And on this first slide in the upper right, here is a picture of what looks like Myrtle Beach, but this is actually Miami Beach, which has just been hit by another cluster of Zika caused by this mosquito, the Aedes genus, of which we have both species here in South Carolina. So we do have the mosquito here in South Carolina. Uh, the studies are underway to see if it carries Zika. We already know from recent reports that this mosquito carries West Nile virus in the Charleston area, and West Nile and Zika are both in the same uh, family. Next slide. Um, are, are we in a tropical or subtropical zone? That is, I think, a question that many people ask. How hot really are we? And uh, if you look at the tropical zone in the upper left-hand corner, you will see that uh, the uh, latitude or the attitude is moving northward to the southeastern United States and Gulf Coast. In the upper right, global warming uh, is indeed real, and these are July temperatures for the last several decades, and the top red graph, as a similar graph was shown recently, is July 2016 significantly higher than the averages for all previous years. So no question we're getting hotter. In the lower left, uh, we are what is called um, a uh, subtropical but humid uh, zone. And we will very soon, as uh, t global temperatures rise, become a tropical zone, very much like the Caribbean. And in the lower right is a map, again, from uh, NOAA, uh, showing uh, where the concentrations of humidity and mosquitoes are, with the largest, of course, in South Florida, the Miami area, but also Charleston, uh, which you can barely see on this slide from that projection, but uh, very real uh, existence of the combination of humidity, mosquitoes, and standing water. Next slide. There are dozens of emerging infectious diseases which we have studied, I personally have studied for decades. Many are related to climate change, those that I have an asterisk by, but I call your attention to the lower left, dengue. Dengue, which used to be a tropical, purely tropical disease in the Caribbean and uh, Central America, has now become endemic, resident in South Florida, in the Keys, with cases popping up frequently along the Gulf Coast states and uh, every uh, year in Florida. And dengue has been, in the last decade, uh, the prototypical example of the newest of the emerging infectious diseases thanks to humidity, standing water, and mosquitoes. Next slide. 
What else do we have along South Carolina's coast? Well, we have harmful algal blooms. Interesting. Why would that be important? Well, we're familiar with the terms red tide and brown tide. We've seen uh, various tidal events offshore brought in, and these are caused by uh, tiny algae that produce some very potent toxins that can make us ill and even kill us and kill our pets. What has happened, though, is that as people uh, have uh, made more people and we make more residential and subdivision areas with these cute little ponds in your backyard, if we don't aerate those ponds, they become stagnant, and hence you have pond scum. And this is what is being studied at uh, Hilton Head and Kiowa right now. Uh, Horry County has done, I think, a reasonably good job in that in regard to uh, ponds in residential areas. But be aware that harmful algal blooms uh, and pond scum that is created if the ponds are not properly aerated can pose a health hazard to not only humans but your pets. Next slide. Back to fish. Okay. Uh, what about fish? Well, there are Caribbean reef fish that we enjoy thoroughly. Grouper, one of my favorites. Um, uh, amberjack, uh, that's often called barracuda too. Red snapper, another one of my favorites. We used to think of these as purely tropical fish, and yet back in 1998 uh, uh, in Texas and then in South Carolina in 2004, we actually had our citizens, in, uh, two in Charleston, who caught grouper and became ill from a uh, fish poisoning. Now we are aware that there are a number of fish poisonings, and this one is called uh, is, uh, is a uh, syndrome caused by the uh, harmful algal boom Gambardiscus toxicus that produces uh, ciguatera-like uh, uh, outbreaks, if you will. And it took this couple uh, eating just small portions of this fish and rapidly getting ill within hours. It took them over a year to recover from the symptoms uh, caused by the fish poisoning. And here is a classic example of tropical reef fish, which you would not expect in what offshore Charleston would be a subtropical area, and yet it did occur. So uh, the fish and the temperatures and the uh, Caribbean waters are moving north. Next slide. Zika. Everybody's been asking about Zika. Upper left hand, the primies, uh, primary vector, uh, of which are really three species, but ADEs uh, that causes, as we know, the birth defects there. As of yesterday, the United States has counted 11,528 cases uh, nationally, most of whom have been travelers to South America, Central America, the Caribbean, where Zika has been resident now for probably about two years. Uh, there are now 42 local cases, all in Florida, as of yesterday afternoon, um, although we've known about it again since last year. The interesting thing about Zika, just like West Nile virus, is that four out of five people who get Zika infection don't know it. There's a brand new uh, news report that just hit the wires yesterday. A man who traveled to uh, a Zika area had no symptoms, four out of five people have no symptoms, came home, had sex with his wife. She, caught, she came down with the symptoms. She was the one in five who had symptoms. She got tested, and sure enough, uh, she, although she didn't travel, she caught Zika that way. So, so it is not only a mosquito transmitted, it's a sexually transmitted disease. There's no treatment or cure or vaccine yet, and here um, in the bright lights, it's hard to see, but the uh, baby with the tiny head and the microcephaly, the neurologic, the musculoskeletal defects uh, in women who, in any stage of pregnancy, particularly early, can get it, uh, is horrific. The economic cost of lifetime care for a baby who has only a partially developed brain is in the millions. And we all know that the poor folks in Central South America, the Caribbean particularly, cannot afford millions in helping for lifetime care. Next slide, where is it now? Well, the map shows the purple areas, uh, South Central, the Caribbean, et cetera, and it's <laughs> now uh, also in the Bahamas, by the way. Uh, there are now over 50 countries, uh, and in the Americas, of course, we have uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands included in that. In the upper uh, 
frame, first time in history, and I'm quoting the CDC director, Dr. Tom Friedman, never before in history has there been a situation where a bite from a mosquito can result in a devastating malformation. Mosquito bites have caused diseases for eons, and uh, this is why the early 1670 settlers in Charleston didn't settle on the peninsula because it was all marsh and miasma and bog, and they thought that was where disease was. So they settled on higher ground, uh, West Ashley, and uh, the upper West Ashley and Mount Pleasant there. But then they found out Charleston did have some high ground on the east side. <laughs> but that took them a decade. But uh, it gives you an idea, though, that uh, uh, they were scared of disease directly caused by Zika. Now we have a disease, a hor horrific, lifelong condition indirectly caused by Zika that targets actually the neuronal cells, cells of the brain. On the next slide, well, what about the latest data around the country? Well, a very few states, only Wyoming, has not had many people travel to these areas, but the darker colored states represent areas in which travel-associated Zika cases have returned home, had symptoms, and been diagnosed. Uh, but should we test everybody for Zika? Well, just yesterday afternoon, the FDA is now requiring all blood banks across the country, whether Red Cross or private, to test for Zika. They've been testing for a number of other communicable diseases that are transmitted by blood donation for a long time, hepatitis, HIV, things of that nature. But now, for the first time, Zika. I donated blood a few months back before that requirement went in into place, and I had to fill out a detailed questionnaire about travel history. And if I had traveled to any of these countries in the last month, 30 days, then I couldn't donate blood. Now, that was their screening up until the FDA saying, you now have to do one of these tests, and it only adds about $10 to the cost of, of the blood donation. But as of yesterday afternoon, uh, travelers returning to all of these states uh, have been diagnosed with Zika. Now, what about Florida and the local transmission? This has been the big concern. Uh, as of yesterday afternoon, again, 42 local transmission cases, and the CDC's recommendation is uh, avoid travel to this area if you're pregnant or if you are a man and you and your wife or partner intend to have children then avoid travel. What if you're pregnant and live in that area? Well, there are CDC recommendations there, too. What if you already have a child? Well, the, um, the obstetrician and the pediatrician would need to work together. The first cluster was within a one-square-mile area just north of central Miami in the Wynwood district there, and they thought that was just a, uh, one or two cases that, although they had no history of travel, maybe were just unknowns. And, and then, boom, all of a sudden, uh, they realize we've got local transmission, just like Brazil, just like other countries. So they ramped up their mosquito control programs, and Republican Governor Rick Scott of Florida personally called President Obama and, and said, we need the federal help. As you recall, Congress adjourned this summer without appropriating what President Obama requested in mosquito control and other research vaccine development programs. And the Congress is still sitting on that, or not. But hopefully that would have been one cluster. Well, funny thing happened. Um, uh, as of uh, just uh, two weeks after that, two weeks ago, we learned of another cluster in Miami Beach. And up here, you see in the upper right-hand corner what looks like Myrtle Beach. Actually, that's Miami Beach. Uh, you could have the same problem. Now, Horry County has, at the moment, zero cases of Zika travel associated or otherwise. Horry County does a good job with water runoff into the beaches. Uh, I wish I could say the same with some of the other coastal uh, counties. Um, and this is the area of, of active Zika transmission, two areas there uh, in the southeast Florida. But now the Florida Department of Health is saying they're now investigating non-travel related cases outside of this area, Tampa, St. Pete area, Gainesville, and a few others. Is the virus moving north? Possibly. No one knows for sure until the investigations are complete. Next slide. What about South Carolina? As of 4 o'clock yesterday, South Carolina Department of Health Environmental Control, DHEC, that I used to be 
uh, state epidemiologist for and retired from there three years ago. Uh, they turned out this map. They had always given us numbers, but the total number of cases in, of Zika in South Carolina as of yesterday afternoon, 43, with eight in Charleston and three in Newberry, four in Dorchester, six in Richland, seven Lexington, uh, Greenville, seven. Okay, but these are all travel related, which makes perfect sense because these are your population centers where people can afford to travel. How many people in poor rural uh, Barnwell or Allendale or Bamberg can afford to travel to the Caribbean? Uh, very few. That's why you don't have cases there. Okay. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, we have time hopefully a little bit later for questions. But it gives you an idea that unless we do something community-wise in two ways, controlling runoff water and standing water, that's important for communities and for our, our uh, local city and state governments. And second, in mosquito control. Uh, Horry County has a good mosquito control program, as does Charleston and Buford. But most of the poor counties in South Carolina do not. We need to do a much better job in mosquito control. Not only aerial spraying for the flying insects, but larval standing water spraying. What can you do as an individual? Two things. Number one, remove all standing water. Refresh your bird baths every week, if not more often, and watch out for standing water in uh, animal pet dishes, uh, flower pots, things of that nature. Do not give the mosquitoes anywhere to lay their eggs and breed. Second thing you can do is what I do. I keep a can of mosquito repellent at every door at my house so that when I go, I'm a mosquito magnet. When I go outside, um, I always spray. Even if it's just to go to my car to get something and come back. They, they find me very quickly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ball. Appreciate that. Good pointers. Um, we are so honored to have our next panelist with us today. Chief Judge Jennifer Wilson was first appointed on December 28, 1999 to serve as the first full-time judge, chief judge for the city of Myrtle Beach. She's also the first and only African-American Myrtle Beach judge. In addition to her duties on the bench, she serves as a department head, supervising three part-time judges and a staff of 15. Prior to going on the bench, Judge Wilson practiced criminal defense and family law in her solo practice in Conway. She previously served as assistant public defender and assistant solicitor for the 15th Judicial Circuit. She received her BA degree cum laude from Spelman College in 1977 and her law degree from Rutgers University School of Law in Newark, New Jersey. And Judge Wilson, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Let me, let me just start off by saying I don't really know why I'm here. Um, <laughs> we have all of these experts. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a physician. I'm not an engineer. Um, but I am a citizen. Um, I'm a mother, soon to be grandmother. Um, and I'm a judge. And um, I believe that, that my being here signifies the importance of having not just the experts um, come together and address this very crucial issue, but that um, we need to educate and inform as many people as we can. Um, this is very frightening, very frightening. Um, like I said, I'm, a, I'm about to be a grandmother for the first time, and uh, when things hit you at home, I mean, then you really, really want to take an interest and you want to uh, do something if you can. Uh, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, I was at home and I was drinking a bottle of water, and I I went to put it in the trash can instead of the recycling. And I thought about the fact that you know I'm going to have a grandchild living on this earth years from now, and so I've got to make sure that I do what I can so that my grandchild and my future grandchildren will have a a safe healthy environment to live in. Um, well, until or unless we address the issues of climate change um, and all the issues that the doctor talked about, about Paul talked about, then um, we're putting our children at risk, our grandchildren at risk. And as I was listening, I was thinking, how, how is it that we can, how can we get 
people, the stakeholders, how can we bring people to the table? Um, there's so much going on in our country and in our world that people seem to focus on that, that divides us all. And, and we're spending so much time and focusing on those things. What, what is it going to take for us to come together? Because we have common issues such as this that, that we have to, we need to address. And, and I believe when people feel that, that it affects them personally, it affects their families, their children, then they're more willing, they're more open to listening and to learning and then consequently uh, acting to, to try to resolve these issues. Um, I, I grew up in Walterboro. Um, I was born in Charleston, and so I'm a low country girl, and um, I've lived in Horry County for 30 years. So I experienced Hugo, um, and I remember how, how horrible that was, and, and getting up the next morning and several days later coming over to Myrtle Beach and um, seeing where a friend of mine's beach house was, and it was no longer there. And uh, some of you may remember that boat that was in the middle of the highway at McClellanville. Um, and to see that and to experience that, and the first time I drove to Charleston after Hugo, I pulled over um, because I, where there had been trees they were gone because the the um, storm they had, had popped the tornadoes had popped the trees and it, and it was the forest wasn't there and I pulled over and I started crying because it was like so overwhelmingly you know um, it was just so traumatic um, but to to have lived through that and to live here and to see just the changes that have occurred in terms of uh, living on the coast and the change in the weather. And, and the heat and the humidity, um, I, it's, it's hot, it's hot. Um, <laughs> for the first time, and I don't mean any harm, I, I've loved the beach, I grew up on the beach, I love it. For the first time in my life, I thought, you know, I think I might retire uh, up in the mountains. <laughs> I'm serious. It, you know, I'm getting older and I'm thinking, I don't know if I can just take this. But you know, that's a very, that's real. That's real. Um, because it wasn't, I mean, when I was a little girl and we played outside from, you know, dusk to dawn and children can't do that now. Uh, it's too hot. The animals are, are um, having a very difficult time. Um, as far as, as being a judge and living in Myrtle Beach and being a, a, a part of the Myrtle Beach city community, um, I'm very involved in, in what the city is doing. And Myrtle Beach, I must say, is very proactive and, and works very hard in, in protecting our shorelines and, and beach renourishment. And um, our city councilman, Ms. Jeff Cotis, is here, and I'd like to give her kudos for that. Uh, but, you know, we, we have so much more to do, and with Myrtle Beach being a tourist area, we have more and more people that are coming here, um, and more and more people that are coming here, and they don't have jobs. Um, our homeless population is growing as well as Charleston, if you just, I mean, down, to, it's everywhere, but we, that's a, a big, big concern of ours. And, and people with health issues, um, people with depression, people with mental health issues, which is another one of my pet peeves, and, and, and how do we, you know, have people come in, in in court who are charged with crimes, and they are mentally ill, um, and what do we do? I mean, there's no place for them to go. I can't send them anywhere. These people may not, you know, belong in jail, but again, it could be a result of somebody being displaced because of something with the weather or flood or, and, and it's all related. So we all have a stake in, in these issues and we've got to, again, address them. Um, I don't want to just put everybody in jail. Um, I don't, I can't, the homeless people come and while there are homeless people who have put themselves in that position, um, they still 
are here in our area and they need food, clothing, and housing. And so a lot of them resort to uh, crime because, you know, that, that's what they, in their minds, that's what the answer is. But I say all that to say that, that um, all of these issues are related. They all affect us. They all affect our future. Um, and so I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's been very enlightening to me, and, and I am willing to do whatever, play any part in whatever and how, however I can as a, a citizen of South Carolina, um, as a judge, which I, of course I'm very limited in, in what I can do, <coughs> but um, being a mother and, and again, soon to be grandmother, um, I think a lot of people like me um, that we, we're willing to, to do what we need to do. Uh, you know, I'm trying to protect my daughter from Zika. That's very, very frightening. Um, but these issues are real. And I, I guess I, I just want to say, um, I, again, it just, it disturbs me that there's so much focus on things that divide us in this country, that if we could focus on what we have in common what our goals are, um, where our interests lie, um, that we, we have enough work to do. We have things to do. We have issues we can focus on that, that, that affect us all, that can bring us together and keep us together and not divide us. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Judge Wilson, thank you for that personal and, and wise <coughs> perspective and reminding us of the humanity that's at stake behind this issue. Appreciate that. Our next presenter is Omar Muhammad, who's a community advocate and activist and currently president of the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities. He's volunteered for that organization since 2007. And over his time, uh, he has focused on mitigation efforts between the Alliance and the State Ports Authority a clean power plan for South Carolina, and environmental justice and outreach to targeted communities throughout the state. He's currently working with the Medical University of South Carolina to address health disparities and to monitor air quality using citizen science. Mr. Muhammad is also an advocate and leader of STEM programs for community youth. And somehow, somehow in his spare time, he happens to be a fisheries biologist for the Department of Natural Resources. I don't know how he does it all. But thank you so much for being with us, Omar. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Um, I would like to also take this opportunity to thank the sponsors uh, for the opportunity here to um, add to this conversation um, about environmental justice and how climate justice, climate change um, relates to that. Um, some people are disproportionate, uh, communities are disproportionate um, impacted by climate change. Um, and those communities are impacted in very extreme uh, measures um, because of uh, low income levels, uh, the education, uh, 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 understanding of impacts of, of storms or preparing uh, themselves and their communities for uh, uh, extreme weather events, um, uh, access to information to uh, um, improve their living conditions, to, to um, increase their uh, uh, resilience uh, to to uh, uh, these extreme events as well. Um, for example, we see climate justice and environmental justice issue. Um, one is there's, there's many factors that contribute to this, th th these concerns. And particularly they are for communities that live along the, the coastal communities, particularly the Sea Island uh, communities. Um, Communities that experience higher uh, chronic diseases, th those communities are gr at greater risk. Uh, like I said before, lower income communities, uh, people who lack access to insurance. Uh, so those, those, those uh, individuals are impacted as well. Um, communities that have language barriers. Um, so information that is shared to communities, it has to be in in different languages so communities can, can, can um, understand the impact. So, so those are some barriers as well. And then also, their ability to uh, bounce back from, from 
a weather event that happens in a community. So, so displacement, a lot of community members, uh, we, we saw that in Katrina uh, when community members were displaced. A lot of those community members did not return. And because of that, you had demographic shift within, within the community structure. So those, those communities forever change. Um, and they never can rebound from, from those type of, of, of events. Um, uh, and it's incumbent on us as advocates, as community residents, as uh, the people who take this up as a concern of theirs, that we ensure that these, these community members, that they have a voice at the table. So that, 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 is, that is important. Um, the definition of environmental justice is, is a framework that states that these communities are treated fairly and they are engaged in a meaningful way. So mean, meaningful uh, engagement can mean different things for different people. But for us, meaningful engagement means that you engage these communities at the very beginning. So when you're talking about having discussions around these, these issues, community members need to be engaged in that process. And they need to be engaged in uh, building out the solutions to, uh, to, to, to these uh, uh, concerns. Um, so that, that, that is something. Um, also, um, climate change on, on um, health. With extreme heat events, we have populations who uh, they do not have adequate uh, heating. They do not have adequate um, air conditioning in their homes. So this uh, adds to uh, uh, the chronic illness that many of the, the community members face. So we have uh, heat cramps, uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, dehydration, all these concerns that can be exacerbated with, with uh, uh, climate change and their lack to be able to adapt to those, to those uh, uh, situations appro appropriately. Um, also, air quality. A lot of people don't contribute air quality to climate change. So you have increases in particulate matter, you have increases in uh, uh, th those uh, uh, the kind of particulates that's in the in in the air, uh, the ambient air. Uh, those those particular matters can cause deep health concerns for communities, uh, particularly around people who suffer from asthma. And we know that uh, uh, poor communities uh, uh, suffer from higher asthma rates than than, than uh, uh, other other uh, similar cohorts. Um, so that can lead to ca uh, cardiovascular is illness, respiratory, um, allergy, uh, you know, uh, allergy sy symptoms worsen uh, worsening, um, and as well as extreme events, um, the effects of intensity of storms uh, can have impacts on health. You're talking about mental health. So we're talking about the impact of stress on, on people when they go through those types of, of events, as well as injury and uh, um, uh, illness that, that goes with that. Um, some of the solutions that I, that we constantly talk about as environmental justice um, organizations and how can we prepare our communities to deal with climate change and, and, and resilience. Um, we talk about, again, the true community engagement. So that means not talking past communities, but talking to communities, inv involving them in coming up with the solutions for their community. So we're talking about um, uh, community-specific uh, uh, solutions um, uh, that communities can buy into and they can participate in, um, as well as increase environmental literacy within the community. So communities have to be educated on what, what is climate change, what, what, what contributes to climate change, what contributes to those uh, uh, negative health outcomes and impacts. That has to happen. And also recognizing that community members are, they have a certain level of expertise. Uh, as scientists, we do not have a right to go into a community and engage that community without their permission. Um, and a lot of times that's what happens in research. Um, researchers go into communities, they do the research, they take the information out of the community, and the community is not aware of, of what that information is. So the dissemination of the information, the sharing of the information, um, one of the principles that we follow is, is we follow the uh, community participatory research model. That's where community members, we see them as equals at the table. They participate in the research that we do. Um, and we, we see that as an empowering mechanism so that they can come up with the solutions necessary. Not that the researchers are coming up with the, the solutions to their concerns, but that the community members uh, come up with the solution to their concerns. And also, 
uh, uh, meaningful partnerships. So these, these, res these communities need uh, uh, resources, uh, the necessary resources for them to uh, address some of the concerns that they have um, around uh, climate justice and, climate and environmental justice. Um, lastly, uh, a lot of these communities are fence line communities for a lot of legacy pollution. So these have been happening for generations. And anytime you're talking about uh, a sea level rise or, or, or anything like that, you're talking about water rushing in into areas that are polluted. So this, this polluted water then can rush into communities. And you're talking about already stressed communities being uh, exposed to pollution. So we have to do something um, around better uh, land use management practices and land use decisions. So that's, that's our zoning. So we have to uh, uh, help our uh, community members understand how they as citizens can participate at the political, at the local level to, to uh, uh, politically engage uh, the zoning process to, the, to address some of those legacy pollution that can, can, can become a real issue for communities that are on, on the fence line of industrial operations as well as uh, uh, communities who are in, inundated with uh, uh, numerous brownfields. And many environmental justice communities are. They're, they have several sites that are in their communities or on the per periphery of communities that are, are, are brownfields, Superfund sites. Uh, uh, they host many toxic release inventory sites. So these, these, these types of, uh, 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 I guess, industry and, and, and uh, operations that are in communities can really become uh, problems for um, environmental justice communities when an extreme storm event occurs. Uh, so I would like to just say that um, we as advocates, um, need to push more about engaging our communities, getting our researchers, getting the, the uh, health practitioners, uh, the academics into our communities and bringing the necessary resources in to help us address the concerns around um, environmental justice and climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, and thank you for your leadership in ensuring environmental justice. We appreciate it. Our final panelist, Kenneth McIver, is a training director for the Waccamaw Regional Col Council of Governments in Conway. He conducts training sessions and workshops in Ori, Georgetown, and Williamsburg counties, and is also adjunct professor of business at Ori Georgetown Technical College. In his spare time, Mr. McIver is the Boy Scout leader for Troop 812 in Conway and is a musician with the Wilmington Symphonic Winds. Mr. McIver is a board member for the Myrtle Beach Performing Arts Center, and he earned his MBA from Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Kenna, thank you for being with us. Thank you. You've probably heard of the, the adage that uh, worst one of the biggest fears is public speaking. Well, imagine public speaking with a bunch of experts, and you're not one of them. <laughs> so I'm up here to um, just lend the voice that I'm uh, a resident who's really concerned about the environment, and I'm also a voter, so I use that um, urgency to direct how I vote. Um, I'm not going to speak long because I really wish I was one of the people out there instead of the people up here, because I'm really here to learn, just to understand what uh, um, some of the impacts are. Um, I am a teacher at Orange Sound Tech, but I also am a Boy Scout leader, which, you know, one of the really big tenets is the environment. We really are concerned about uh, environmental impacts of what we do from the small level. Um, recycling is really big. I was really fortunate just on a small level of being a responsible citizen um, of introducing recycling at my church, at my company. And just instituting that and teaching that as a responsible uh, person to my Boy Scouts, you know, just on little things that we can do. Um, um, you know, making sure that we have uh, efficient cars, making sure that my toilet bowl is, is, is one that controls water as, as well as my shower head. So I'm not going to speak much because I really am here to learn a lot, but just a, sort of a citizen um, like Judge uh, Wilson was talking about, just trying to learn and how that affects my community, how it affects what I do, and just being someone that's responsible and uh, someone that really con concerns and cares about the environment. 
I know I have a lot of my, my neighbors here uh, in the community below me, and because I live right along the beach myself. I live maybe a few hundred feet back, not so much on the ocean front, but a lot of what's happening does affect me and my community as well. Um, so I, I really, again, am not too much, uh, don't want to, don't have too much to bring, but I'm really here to learn, and I'm really excited to be here and be a part of this discussion in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. And we're so pleased to count the Boy Scouts as one of our active partners in our Resilience Initiative for Coastal Education. So we look forward to further partnership. So that brings us to you. And we really want to hear from you and what's on your mind after hearing and soaking up all of this information. Uh, we would invite you to ask questions of a particular panelist or the panel at large, and we'll do our best to respond. Uh, and nothing's off, off the table, so, so please speak your minds. <laughs> and I can't remember, uh, Don, do we have a microphone we're going to pass? Okay, fantastic. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, name's John Scanlon. Uh, today we're representing uh, uh, the uh, SCOOP, the uh, United Turtle Enthusiasts. Um, climate change, uh, and I think what we're trying to do is uh, reach out to activate the general uh, community about things that can change. And one thing that I believe is overlooked here is uh, we talked about the water and uh, we're not making any more water, you know, we're treating it. One of our concerns is the off possibility of offshore drill drilling and the horrific impact that can have on the millions of uh, economic uh, that drives this community and the jobs. And there's another factor, fracking. Again, talk about poisoning the very water that we want to drink and to give to our children and our grandchildren. I think we need to raise the awareness of that and perhaps expand uh, the reach of this kind of education uh, to make sure that we are politically active, as our last speaker uh, uh, just mentioned, and to be aware of those forces that can drastically change this community uh, like Katrina. Thank you very much. So excellent question. And would anyone like to address the question or the implications around offshore drilling or perhaps energy more globally? Yes, Paul. Um, I think it came up in a number of ways that there's a lot of water consumption in energy production in general and, and the way we've done it in the past. So there's, there's win-wins to be had by finding uh, different ways to approach energy. There is opportunity, you know, this is where we're going to have to Tomorrow morning or Monday morning when I go to work, I will I will chastise myself because I'm going to step over from being a, an objective researcher to an advocate because right, I'm probably going over the line here. Um, we've been involved with efforts to look at the feasibility of offshore wind in South Carolina for some time, and 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 there's opportunity there, but there's the economics of the of the of the realities of the economics is not quite there yet. But a lot of things are being teed up in that regard in the offshore. There's a good bit of money being put in by Boehm right now that's looking at um, uh, where we could uh, preferentially avoid fishery habitat or uh, cultural resources that might be out there. We've had buoys out doing the wind studies. It, it, there's, an, there's a developer interested in doing uh, a, a project in South Carolina. There's going to be a meeting in North Myrtle Beach in September, end of September, that will bring down Boehm and, and the developers. We're going to bring in a community from Europe that has already gone, and gone through this life cycle of what was going to happen what actually happened when they went to seeing a wind farm off their coast. Um, but there, it, it is part and parcel with the water issue and, 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 and the energy issue because obviously these things you talked about, not besides the, the water quality, they are carbon emitting and they are uh, contributing to the uh, complexities in our atmospheric effort. So there is an opportunity before South Carolina right now. Um, and it's another one of these that are going to be at the, in, in, the, in the pocketbook. Are, are we willing to pay a couple of more pennies per kilowatt hour um, to potentially take some pressure off of our freshwater uh, uses as well as uh, the pressure that we're putting on the atmospheric system. Uh, yes, sir. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Anthony Stewart. Uh, I'm a professor of physics and engineering at Allen University. Uh, so um, my background is in material science, materials engineering, uh, and I do some low-level uh, ab initio modeling of materials used in energy-related applications. And so my question is for Dr. Gaze. Um, your method, it's uh, empirical, modal, decomposition. Uh, so I'm assuming that is based upon some experimental data that you use as an input for the model. So I'm wondering uh, if, if that's true, uh, what input is most significant in determining or having an impact on your model's predictability? That particular method is, is really purely diagnostic of a time series. It's only looking at time series. It's, it's not like um, other techniques that you might use, like Fourier analysis or something like that, which is fitting a series of sine curves, essentially, to describe a function. It's, it's looking at it in terms of the actual intrinsic variability. So in theory, it's not possible to use, uh, or it's not defendable to use as a predictive capability, because it's only looking at the intrinsic variability. But you are pulling out these time domains. It's, it's been used in, in material um, science type applications for analyzing signals for fatigue out of uh, airplane wings and things like that. So you can pull that out, but that making it and using it as a, di as a, as a prognostic tool or, or predictive tool is, is not mathematically defendable, but we think it will be soon. But, but the output of it is gone, the model is a, is a different function. It's a, di it's a different approach. It's, it's a regular physics-based model of, of atmospheric behavior. But that behavioral component was, was brought into it. Great. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Mike Sclafani, registered nurse. I'm a resident of Myrtle Beach. Um, a variety of the speakers were talking about usable water in the future for populations drying up of usable water in different parts of the world, no less in the United States. Uh, but yet, two-thirds of the Earth is ocean water. And so there's plenty of water. The issue is, is there any research on converting that water into usable water? I know it's expensive at present, but uh, gee, I was wondering in Myrtle Beach if we could st start a project to make ocean water more usable for agriculture and human consumption 20 years from now, it might be a good seed program to look into uh, because as our beaches erode, <clears throat> we not, might not draw so many people down here to come to the beaches. We may need other sources of income. And I think that this conversion versus conservation of two-thirds of the water on the earth, which is just there, we can't, uh, so we can use this water somehow. Is there any research being done in any of the universities around converting seawater into usable water? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's already been done. The notion of desalination is something that has been around for a while. But the problem, you get the nail on the head, the problem has been the prohibitive cost of, of, of desal. Now, but to that point, one of the things um, prior to me coming on and serving as the Director of Conservation, I had the pleasure of ser serving as the founder of the Georgia Green Economy Summit, which the premise of that summit was to explore those type of opportunities. Now, one of the things that I was in the last summit that we advocated for is that one of the predominating features of this part of the world is that we have what we call a very high tidal range six feet of water, you know, six feet in Ch uh, Charleston, eight feet in Beaufort, 12 to 13 feet in Savannah. So one of the things we talked about was that with the inherent baseline of marine engineering capability, like all of the oceanographic, all of the oce ocean sciences, all of the ports, that what if you could couple that to um, the tidal influx, which you're talking about billions of deciliters of water coming in and out that you can time your clock to, because baseline is the critical concern with energy generation. How do you time the energy generation that you need to meet the demand? So one of the premises we posited at the last summit was the notion of what if we can couple a systems-based approach 
to using tidal energy as the basis of uh, uh, creating the energy that you would need to drive down the prohibitive energy costs associated with desal. Mm -hmm. But the premise would be simply there, and one of the things I talked to Kevin about, is that those are the low-hanging fruit opportunities that if we were to get proactive about becoming the epicenter of that type of system-based approach to where we can generate both portable water and energy generation, those are the type of solutions that the world would need. And so we can take this paradigm of being entrenched or looking at just the problem, and if we can generate these solutions for the problem, then we could actually be on the cutting edge of actually creating new industries, doing different things to put this, this cord on the map. Now, to your point, who's doing it? Um, one of the leading proponents of tidal energy right now uh, is in the UK and in the West Coast. One of my points of frustration is that this area is probably uh, one of the best places in terms of land geography and underwater typography to do this type of research in the world. In terms of who's leading DSAL, DSAL has been primarily been the United Arab, uh, Arab, Am Emir Arab Emirates who basically don't have, because they are all rich, don't have any concerns <laughs> about you know the prohibitive cost. But their <laughs> thing is that they have been so water deprived and they have been building these great big cities like Dubai to basically, they have literally uh, looked at uh, iceberg acquisition. They're looking at these south. So unfortunately, the irony of ironies, the people who are leading the world in this technology are the people who actually hold the greatest reserve for petroleum, petrochemical, which is leading to this phenomenon where what have a Myrtle Beach need to say, we need this desal technology. But with that being said, the short response is, is that we haven't done it yet, but my premise or my notion that I've been advocating for is that we should be one of the world leaders in that process. Al, thank you. And it is the holy grail of water usage. I'm sorry. Yes, Marcus sir. Ferguson, Allen University. Actually, speaking directly to your question about desalinization and, and Mr. George's uh, comments about the UAE specifically, I just had the opportunity to come back from there in January, and the same facility in which you're talking about for desalinization is actually run by the kings in Dubai. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually interesting due to the fact that the leading uh, institute for research in alternative energy is Mazdar City. Mazar City has one of the largest solar farms in the world. And you would think that this was not supposed to be due to the fact that this is an oil-rich region. But they already understand that this is a limited resource. They already feel that they have to invest in new opportunities. It's not that Dubai overnight became a success. Do you realize that Dubai has less oil input than Abu Dhabi does? Abu Dhabi actually controls all the money. You realize that Abu Dhabi is the richest city in the UAE, but nobody realizes that due to the fact that you see the economic growth in Dubai. Abu Dhabi in itself runs Mazdar City. Abu Dhabi has one of the largest ports in the world. Uh, we had the opportunity to tour it. It's phenomenal, but they strategically position themselves to do this. We asked for a tour of the desalinization facility they stated that the technology was restricted mm. and that you had to get permission from the king. Mm. <laughs> I know, that's crazy, isn't it? It, it, it is. But at the same time, that technology is so revolutionary that they don't even want us to view it. So imagine what potential that could have for us. We're a coastal lying region. They're not only producing desalinated water, they're producing energy at the same time. Imagine, we could literally take the water that is right out here in this bay, produce fresh water and energy at the same time. Imagine if we incorporated that with other activities that we already have going on, such as wind, such as alternative energy like my colleague Dr. Stewart. We have to have a multimodal approach. We can't just have one approach. That's why we have community listening sessions like this, so that we can have these conversations. That you realize they had one of the largest alternative energy summits in, in the world, in Mazdar City. We had leaders from all over the world come there just in order to witness it. Do you realize that this is a completely what, uh, alternative energy powered facility that is a research center and that anyone can go there for absolutely free. The king pays for it. He flies in researchers from all over the world. I think that what we need to do is really sit down and start having these tough conversations that center around finance particularly and talk about the greater good and how, the, how we need to move forward. Right. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, my name is Donna Grimes, and I'm a member of the SCOOD uh, team yeah. here. Um, my question is something I have thought about for quite a while, and that is our disposable society that we live in. 
we, we have so much trash. It just, it just amazes me. Um, moving here from Ohio, um, and I know not just in Ohio, there, outside of where we live, there was this huge mound that's almost as big as a city where they collect <coughs> the trash, take it there, and then they, they cover it up and throw grass seed on it. And then there's this big pipe that comes up out of the ground that releases all of the gases from it. And I know it's not just in Ohio, it's all over the yep. United States. And um, then coming down here and walking the beaches, that's some of the things that we do when we monitor for the turtles, we pick up trash. Yep. And it's all, almost all plastic, yep. plastic. And so my concern, my question then is, is there an impact on our global climate from these places that are, you know, where we, they take the trash to, you know? The landfills. Yes. Is that an impact? Do, I don't know, is that, I mean, I don't know. That's a really is. interesting question, I don't know. Um, if we have a grip or read on that, particularly. Well, there certainly is a lot of recovery of that gas. I mean, Horry County is doing that. There's, they're, they're in the landfill in Conway, they're, they're, they're actually capturing it and then putting it back into use. So, so in some regards, it's recycling some of that. But yeah, the, we, we clearly consume a lot of material and we throw a lot of stuff away. We can conserve, the more we conserve, the easier life will be. I will say that, um, you know, coastal communities have already exhibited leadership in combating the incidence of plastic, and, and uh, particularly if you look at a community like Isle of Palms, which recently passed its ban against plastic bags, single-use plastic bags, and now there's a broader movement, at least within our community, uh, to look at that uh, on a more widespread na na uh, basis. And we see it firsthand, I know as turtle lovers, you, you know this as well, but 8% uh, of the turtles that come into our hospital have incidence of plastic ingestion. That uh, in many cases has contributed to, to health decline. Uh, and we know it's also present in fishes and, and even down to microscopic organisms. So uh, it is a critical issue. It's a critical health issue as well as an environmental one. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, my name is Gothany McLaren, and I'm also a turtle conservationist. And I don't suffer from Zika <laughs> uh, yet, I don't think. But I do suffer from uh, plastic intolerance syndrome. <laughs> And I, I don't have a question as much as I would like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for being here. And also to add that climate change is definitely a huge problem, but plastic in the ocean, I think, is the second biggest issue to climate in the ocean. By 2050, it's estimated that we will have as much plastic in the ocean as fish, which is huge. And I just learned yesterday that um, in this country alone, we use 500 million straws, plastic straws, every single day. Enough straws to fill 27 school buses per day. So I don't know what we're going to do about this issue. Um, I think we could um, desalinize the ocean out there, but what are we going to do about the, the plastic that's already in the ocean? So it's both a question and a, and a, a comment. And I certainly relate to um, Judge Wilson, who's going to be a grandmother. And one of my fears, if I ever was going to be a grandmother, what, what would happen to the baby with all the plastic pollution that's out there? I think we all have to be aware of the plastic pollution and um, and just do everything we can to avoid being a convenience society as opposed to a caring society. Thank you very much. Gavini, thank you for, for that reminder. And I will put in a plug that on March 30th of next year, the South Carolina Aquarium, as well as several conservation partners, including those Gavini is involved with, will be holding a symposium in Charleston, a full day symposium on the impacts of plastics and what they mean to us and how we can look for alternative uses and perhaps better plastics down the road. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, my name is Alice Young, and I am here representing St. John Amy Church on Pauley's Island, South Carolina. And uh, I, too, am a grandmother and very proud to be a grandmother and very concerned about what I've heard here today. Uh, when I was first asked to come, I was hesitant because it was giving up my Saturday morning to do nothing. <laughs> but I am very glad that I did attend because I've heard things here today that is disturbing. And as a parent and grandparent, very fearful, especially um, about the Zika and other health concerns here. And I'm here representing my church and my community. I'm just one. Um, what about all those others who are not here? How can we get this information to them so that they too will hear what I've heard here today and to learn maybe with all of us working together, there is something we can all do to help the situation and be a part of the solution and not the problem. Thank you so much for saying that. And the first thing I'll say <laughs> is we would love to take you up on that invitation to come back and spend time to meet your community and those around you uh, to have further conversations. And that's part of the process uh, that we hope will result from, from these sessions. But I, I'd also ask our panelists to think about ways to engage broader audiences around this topic. Uh, these are the converted in some ways. You showed up because you have interest, but how do we reach the uninterested or the perhaps not knowing? Hmm. I have a, um, a question for Dr. Ball and also to let him know, we have our first um, travel-borne Zika case in Horry County, very close to here. And I told somebody that if you're infected with Zika and a mosquito bites you, that mosquito is now a Zika-borne mosquito. Is that true? Yes, ma'am. The mosquito can carry the virus for several weeks before it dies. And we as humans carry the virus in our blood for several weeks. Uh, and then we become self-immune, permanently immune. The good Lord gave us an amazing immune system. Just like West Nile, we become permanently immune. The flip side of that is that the virus, however, resides in our internal body cavity fluids, which is why it is also a sexually transmitted disease, for many months. And hence the current CDC caveats about sexual transmission. Uh, right now, the Case, there are more cases than, than DHEC as released as of yesterday, 43, and these are CDC-confirmed cases. The DHEC lab in Columbia also does a test, and that's preliminary positive, and that's where you get your current information from that, yes, you do have a travel-related case here. But DHEC won't call it that until the CDC confirms it, and they're backlogged by several weeks now. So of the 43 cases, all are travel-related except for one, who was a lady whose husband went on a mission trip, came back, and infected her. He had symptoms, and she had symptoms. So my point is we could have people running around Horry County who are Zika-infected because they've traveled somewhere. And so we all have to be careful of mosquitoes. We do, and that's why I mentioned uh, the personal need for removing all standing water around your house, and if it's in the uh, drainage ditch in front, call the county to come put larvicide in that ditch, and also to use plenty of insecticide because it's going to be at least a year or more before we have an effective vaccine. Thank you. So there's nothing, say someone who is going to be traveling into another country, there's nothing they can take or you know, shots or anything that would Prevent them from good, good question. Uh, the, is there a preventative of some sort that a traveler can take? And the short answer is no, other than plenty of mosquito repellent, and uh, uh, including for several weeks after you come back, because everyone gets bitten, in spite of the best precautions. So. Assume that you have the virus in your blood for two weeks after you return from a Zika positive area, including Miami. Thank you, Doctor. 
Well, let's give the families a round of applause.